in the second Geithner video, I lay out a scenario where a bank could, let me draw its balance sheet. Let's say, no, that's not how I wanted to do it. Let's say that this is a bank. It's holding, let me draw its assets and liabilities. So it's holding some toxic asset A right here. And this for that could be the bank's equity, that's its liabilities, and this is the other assets for the bank. So it could hold some toxic asset A, and we laid out a scenario where what the bank could do right now has a hundred percent exposure to A. What it could do is it could take a little bit of cash, lend it to another party, let's say it could lend it to a hedge fund. So this becomes a loan to the hedge fund. Right? So now the book the hedge fund owes this money to our bank and it now has the cash on its balance sheet. Right? So this would now instead of being cash, it'll be it'll be called loan loan to hedge fund. Now this is the hedge fund's balance sheet. Its liability is loan from bank. And now it has this cash, and then it could use this cash to invest in this, uh, in, in essentially the legacy loans program, the, the public-private investor legacy loans program that, that Geithner talks about. And if they did this, they could take this, let's say this was $7. They could take the $7, contribute it to the equity in the program. The Treasury would contribute another $7. The Fed would contribute $84, and then they would have a hundred dollars, and I know this is kind of messy, but they would have a hundred dollars that they can then use to go buy these assets, right? And the net effect of this is, is that a bank, this bank went from having a hundred percent exposure to this toxic asset to having only seven dollars exposure through this loan to this hedge fund or this special purpose entity or whatever you want to call it. And I got a couple of emails and even from uh, some colleagues saying, well, you know, is this really, can this really be done? And you know, my, my, my kind of knee-jerk reaction was, well, if this can't be done, they'll figure out a way to do it because there's billions of dollars of stakes. And, and really, the incentive here is structured to do it. And frankly, the government probably wants them to do it because on some level, even though this would be a massive transfer of exposure and wealth from taxpayers, from the banks, from the taxpayers to the banks, it would on some level solve the problem. And if people really aren't aware of it, everyone will be happy about it because, you know, all of these banks, Citibank and Bank of America will just survive and, you know, they, they can just kind of say that all all's well. So what I, I wanted to do just to answer those questions is get a little bit particular about the wording. And I got an email uh, Lay Logan actually emailed me, and she she highlighted one clause in the uh, legacy loans term sheet that seems to address what I talk about in that in that uh, second video there. And it says, private. This is from the legacy loans term sheet. It says private investors may not participate in any PPIF. So this is a you know private public investment fund that purchases assets from sellers that are affiliates affiliates of such investors or that represent 10% or more of the aggregate private capital in the PPIF. So the question is, what's an affiliate? And then I looked up you know, in the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, and there are multiple definitions, but this is probably the best one. It's, you know, the term affiliate means any company that controls, is controlled by, or is, an, or is under common control with another company. And that scenario that I just outlined, this bank really doesn't control this hedge fund, right? They just essentially gave them a loan with uh, very little stipulations on it, and then the hedge fund can go do it. But you could say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing that this bank could do. There's nothing that this bank could do to force this hedge fund to buy these assets, so maybe this plan won't work. And another thing is, you know, what's the definition of the private capital, right? You also can't represent 10% more of the aggregate private capital. Frankly, when I think of private capital, I think more in terms of equity investments, but maybe the definition of private capital also includes debt investments, although I doubt it. So in this video, I want to lay out a scenario that essentially they can do the same thing economically and in, in, in fact, incent the exact behavior that they want in the other parties without being in any way an affiliate of, of the counterparty and in no way uh, giving capital directly to them. So what Bank A could do instead, let me redraw it, actually not Bank A, the bank that's holding toxic asset A. 
And figure this is what I thought of after kind of thinking about it for about five or ten minutes. You can imagine what the banks will come up with when they have billions of dollars in careers on the stake online. So if you have a scenario where you have this toxic asset A, and you economically want to do what I described, but you just want to, you don't want to be an affiliate and you don't want to give the appearance of self-dealing. What you do is you sell credit defaults on A that become super cheap. So you have essentially $7 exposure of credit defaults. Well, let me, let me do it this way. So what you do is you sell credit default swaps. So let's say you sell $7 of exposure. So your liability right here is a $7 CDS exposure, and I'll go over the economics of how this works in a second. And you sell, you actually get some some an income stream, and it wouldn't even be accounted this way. You normally just have to, if if you're insuring seven dollars worth of credit default swaps, your liability isn't seven dollars. It's you know you you do the probability of default and all of that, so your liability will probably be I don't know one dollar, whatever it is, and you get some income stream for it. But the the general notion is is that you sell sell credit default swaps on this toxic asset on a on a for really cheap for really cheap and just so you know what a credit default swap is i've made a couple of videos on it it is essentially an insurance policy on a loan or or on a company and if that company or this loan defaults you say that you're going to pay up uh, essentially the insurance amount so what you do is you sell $7 Seven dollars of credit default swaps on A, and just so you know, most of these toxic assets that these banks hold, these are assets that they were uh, the originators for, and so they're very particular to the individual banks. So a bank can definitely say, "I'm selling a credit default swap on A," and they know that in the end, when I kind of outline this whole thing, they'll be the main beneficiary of it. So if you sell seven dollars credit default swaps on A, what would I do? Well, I'm a hedge fund. What I do is I buy those credit defaults for really cheap, and then I invest in the TALF, right? So let's say I'm a hedge fund, and I have two things. I have a uh, seven seven dollar investment in the in the TALF, in the ta in, in, sorry in the in this Geithner plan investment, and then I also have this credit default swap, this insurance contract. And just so you know, you pay a few, uh, you know, depending on the price, you pay a certain amount every year. But the, the key here is that this bank could sell it if they wanted to for almost free, right? They can essentially give away these credit default swaps. So if, if that bank did it, then if the hedge fund's assets would have the $7 investment in this Geithner program, and then it'll have $7, $7 of credit default swap protection. Now what happens to this hedge fund? In the world where asset A is worth a lot, they get all of the upside through their investment in the Geithner plan, right? That $7 investment gets levered to $100, right? And they go, let me actually do draw that again. So that $7 investment is here, $7 of capital, $7 from the treasury. You have $86 from the Fed. And they use this to give the cash here and then that goes back here, and you're holding toxic asset A. Now, if toxic asset A ends up being worth a lot of money, then this hedge fund, then this is worth a lot, and this is worth nothing. And that's OK, because the hedge fund essentially paid nothing for it, or paid next to nothing for it. And in which, in, in which case, um, you know, and everyone kind of works out well in that scenario. On the other hand, let's say that this thing is worth zero, right? Let's say that this thing defaults. If that thing defaults, then this investment is worth zero, but guess what? The hedge fund had an insurance policy where this guy was a counterparty. So he says, hey, this thing here defaulted. I'm going to get claim my insurance policy, so this guy is going to have to send him $7. So it's economically the exact same thing that I outlined in the Geithner 2 video. But in this situation, these guys, it's almost an arm's length transaction. But this bank can make that behavior happen by essentially going into the market and selling credit default swaps for this exact asset for really, really cheap. And this is just the first way I thought about it. There's other ways you could do it. If you have enough of, if you're just a separate hedge fund and you own enough of the, the shares in a bank, let's say you owned all of the shares in the bank or, or a good percentage of the shares in the bank, then you would also have an incentive to go out there and buy 
the uh, uh, to to use the Geithner plan and lever up and buy these assets. Another thing is, I don't want to get too technical. If you kind of hold one of the fulcrum pieces of debt, the pieces of debt that are trading at a discount because you're afraid that this bank is going to fail, if you hold a bunch of those those assets, you still would want to participate in the Geithner plan and funnel money and use the government money to essentially buy this asset A. I mean, the general theme here is, if you have two people, right, if these are, this is the private world, and you have a scenario where person A, if a transaction can make $100, or he gets rid of $100 of exposure, and person B, person B essentially has a potential loss of minus $7 of exposure, there's a net transfer of wealth here, right? You went from $100 of exposure to uh, to $7 of exposure for this guy, right? So someone is offloading the $93 of exposure to this stuff, and that's the government. And the government's only taking the downside. So this is a huge uh, subsidy of exposure. It depends what these are really worth. If these thing, if this thing is really worth $30 and it's a $63 exposure, but at any time you have this, the private sector is going to figure out a way is going to figure out a way to make the subsidy happen. And the, everything I've outlined so far is if A is the bank that has 100% exposure, all they have to do is through whatever you know backdoor scheme or financial product or insurance or whatever they want to do, or loans that have you know very little stipulations on it, they just have to give this guy essentially $7 of compensation somehow that you know, gets around the government rules, and then this transaction will occur. And I hope it doesn't occur, and it's very possible it won't, because maybe I'm missing something here. But I'm just saying that if you know everything I understand about the Geithner plan is, is if there's a huge incentive for this to occur, and this is frankly the only reason why the plan would work, because as I outlined in the other videos, for for a private investor who's not incented in this way, the put option that the government is giving them still is not enough of a rationale to go from paying thirty dollars for an asset to going to pay $60 an asset. So it won't work if this behavior doesn't occur. The only way that the plan, quote unquote, will work and people will overpay for the assets is if you have this type of action going on.